Welcome to Ypres, Belgium. Y-P-R-E-S is the French spelling. But here in the Dutch speaking part of Belgium, you're more likely to find it spelled I-E-P-E-R, pronounced Ypres. Of course, the British soldiers who fought here didn't use either name. They called it Wipers. Ypres is best remembered today as the town around which some of the worst fighting in all of human history took place. But the history of this place goes back to ancient times. A town on this site was raided by the Romans more than 2,000 years ago. And since that time, it's been fought over by the English, the French, even the Austrians. 800 years ago, Ypres had a population of around 40,000 people, making it one of the largest cities in all of Western Europe. It was even mentioned by Geoffrey Chaucer in his Canterbury Tales. For most of its history, Ypres has been known best for the cloth trade, and that was centered around the 13th century building, the Cloth Hall that you see behind me, which is the most famous of all of Ypres' landmarks. Most of that building was destroyed by artillery fire during the Great War, but it's since been rebuilt. During the course of the war, there were at least five distinct battles that were fought here. And each of those major battles could be broken down into multiple battles with names and identities of their own. The first Battle of Ypres in October and November 1914 produced a quarter million casualties. The second Battle of Ypres saw the introduction of poison gas to the Western Front in the spring of 1915, and that produced 100,000 casualties. The third Battle of Ypres, more often known as Passchendaele, was fought in the summer and fall of 1917 and may, has, may have produced as many as 800,000 casualties. The fourth Battle of Ypres, also known as the Battle of the Lys, was fought in April 1918 as part of the German Kaiserschlacht offensive and that produced around 200,000 casualties. The last battle, sometimes known as the Fifth Battle of Ypres, was fought in the fall of 1918 and produced around 10,000 Allied and an unknown number of German casualties. And of course, between all of these battles, there's skirmishing, artillery duels, sniper fire, disease, and much more. Needless to say, Ypres earned its place in history as one of the deadliest places on earth, especially for British Commonwealth and German forces. So in this series, we'll be looking at snapshots within those battles, telling stories of some of the units and even individual soldiers who fought here. And of course, we'll look at some of those iconic places associated with each of these battles. One of the places you can clearly see the evidence of the destruction that happened here a hundred years ago is here next to St. Martin's Cathedral. Behind me you can see there are the remnants of the old cathedral, pieces of it that have almost been laid out like a, like a cemetery, like a memorial that shows parts of the cathedral that were never rebuilt and then there's an entire building uh, an old chapel uh, on the other side here that I'll let you take a look at in just a second that also was never rebuilt. Mm -hmm. 
In the 1920s, as the town was being rebuilt, the work of remembering the fallen was also taking place. The town was home, at least temporarily, for many of the citizens of Britain and the Commonwealth who were here to build memorials and to carry out the work of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. Ypres also became a place of pilgrimage for the hundreds of thousands of families who lost loved ones in the Ypres salient. Those people needed a place to gather, to pray, and to remember. And this chapel became a place to do just that. It's known as St. George's Chapel, named for the patron saint of England. It was built in 1927 and to this day remains one of the most important sites for remembrance and pilgrimage here in Ypres. This chapel may be one of the best places to fully grasp the fact that these men did not die in a vacuum, but they left behind families and a nation, multiple nations, who mourned their loss. And this place became one of those places where they could come and remember and honor them. And you see memorials to entire units or memorials to men from a particular town and many memorials to individuals as well. So why Ypres? Why did this town become notorious as one of the bloodiest and most awful places in the history of warfare? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is location. It's a strategic crossroads, much like Gettysburg in the American Civil War. From here, the German army could march on the strategic coastal towns of Dunkirk, Calais, Boulogne. It was also one of the last major obstacles to complete control of Belgium for the Germans. So there were obvious strategic reasons for both sides to occupy the town. The Allies built their defenses around the outside of the town and this created a salient, a bulge in the line that would be attacked by the Germans from three sides throughout the war. It's also important to note that the Germans held the high ground surrounding the salient, making it easier for artillery observers to locate targets. And it didn't take long for the casualties to mount in circumstances like that. Now as for the horror of the landscape, the flooding and the mud that became so synonymous with battles like Passchendaele, Third Ypres, it's pretty simple. This is like much of this part of Europe, an area with very low ground in terms of its relation to sea level. And the water table is high, meaning you don't have to dig down very far and you hit groundwater. So when it rains, 
and it rains here a lot, it doesn't take much to cause flooding. Now over the centuries, the people of this land had built systems for keeping the ground relatively dry. And you can see a lot of those systems today. But as with many other things, the incessant artillery fire had destroyed those systems. And so in addition to the death and destruction that was found on many great war battlefields, Ypres was also known for the mud. And the mud just wasn't some annoyance that had to be dealt with, it was deadly. Men would get stuck in the mud in areas of no man's land and no one could risk exposure to help them. They would sink until they drowned in the mud. This also meant that attacks had to go over these duckboard pathways that were built over the mud, which provided easy killing lanes for enemy machine guns and artillery. It was a recipe for slaughter on a scale witnessed only a handful of times in human history. And it's also a big part of the reason why so many of the men who fell here were never identified or never found at all. I'm now in a very busy, very loud Lille gate. And this is a cool place to come because you get to see the original Imperial War Graves Commission signs. They're all now the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. But these are some of the originals. You have to remember that in the years after the war, there were thousands of families who wanted to come and see the final resting place of their loved one but you don't have GPS, you don't even really have maps at the time that can give you accurate information. And so all you knew was to go to Ypres and then from there, try and find your way. And so these signs were placed all over the place and you see them all over the Western Front to this day. You'll see signs telling you where cemeteries are, where prominent parts of the battlefield are. And those are just some of the originals of that. This is also a really cool place, the Lille Gate, because Again, you get a really nice sense of the original fortifications that existed around this city. It's got this moat that surrounds everything. It's about as medieval castle-like as you can get, but it's actually dated to the later, uh, to a later time period than the medieval time. And there's also the Ramparts Cemetery up here, and we're gonna go take a look at that. I've said it before, but one of the things I love about British and Commonwealth graves is the ability for families to put messages on the bottom. I love this one. He could not have had a better end, but as we see it, it came too soon. So both sharing their grief, but also their pride in his service at the same time. And I, I want to find out the circumstances of Lieutenant Moxley's death, if I can. T. Hopkins, Row of Fusiliers, Christ will link the broken chain closer when we meet again from mum, brother, and sisters. And they could not ask for a more beautiful place to lie today right here in the Rampart Cemetery. <laughs> 
Winston Churchill said of Ypres, quote, a more sacred place for the British race does not exist in the world, end quote. He proposed that the town be left in ruins as a permanent memorial to what happened here. Of course, the people of the town disagreed and reconstruction began, but a permanent memorial was placed here where hundreds of thousands of British and Commonwealth soldiers passed as they exited the town and headed to their deaths. It's known as the Menin Gate. And later on in this series, we'll take a closer look at the gate, its history, and its significance to this day. I want to invite you to join me on this journey as we learn more about the people and places associated with the Battle of Ypres. standing now near one of the most visited sites on the Ypres salient. You see the train tracks behind me. Well, when those uh, tracks were first laid in the 1850s, the area was cut to provide for those tracks. And so the spoil, the dirt from the cutting of those tracks was dumped on either side of the tracks. And the spoil on that side became known during the war as Hill 60. The spoil on this side became known as the Caterpillar. We're gonna talk a little bit more about both of those, but I wanna give you a sense of where we are because then if you look in this direction, you can actually see the spires of the churches in Ypres itself. So it's a great place to get a real sense of what's happening here. And this is also a place where men from many nations were involved in the fighting over the four years of the conflict here on the salient. So let's take a look around uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the battles that took place here. We'll talk about the tunneling, the war underground that may have been more vicious here than anywhere on the Western Front. And we'll talk about exactly what happened here. So let's talk about the history of the fighting here. Like most places on the Ypres salient, fighting took place here from the fall of 1914 right up to near the end of the war. Since the hill was 60 meters above sea level, thus the name, it provided a key observation point for artillery spotters, so both sides wanted to take and hold this position. The Germans originally took the hill from the French on December 10, 1914. The British recaptured it on April 17, 1915. But in May of the same year, after a massive attack using large quantities of chlorine gas, the Germans retook it and then quite literally cemented their possession of the hill. But while the fighting continued in the trenches above ground, the real war here was the one below the surface. Here's a perfect illustration of how vicious the fighting was here and how close it was. This tells us this was the French front line in December of 1914 and then of course the British took over the front line here in January 1915. Now take a look right where that man is standing. That's the German front line. 
Their trenches were dug that close. They could talk to each other. They could lob grenades at each other if they wanted to. But that's how close they were. December 1914. Now we're talking about the German front line. And just up there to that platform is the Allied line. This is the monument to the Queen Victoria's rifles, which was placed here after the Second World War because the original had been destroyed by the Germans. Second Lieutenant Jeffrey Woolley was serving with that battalion in the fighting here on Hill 60 in April of 1915. On the night of the 20th into the 21st of April, he and a handful of men were the only defenders on the hill and they continually repelled attacks to hold on to this position. Woolley encouraged his men to hold the line against heavy machine gun fire and terrible artillery fire. For a time, he was the only officer on this hill. When he and his men were finally relieved on the morning of April 21st, only 14 men remained out of an original company strength of 150. For his gallantry that night, Woolley was awarded the Victoria Cross and he became the first man from a territorial unit to receive that honor in the First World War. So just as with every First World War battlefield, you have to use your imagination a little bit because there's all this growth, these trees, none of this would have been here. If you look at pictures from World War I battlefields, by the time you get to 1915, 1916, 1917, you're looking at barren landscapes that look like the moon. You're looking at craters everywhere. All of the trees have been either taken down for use by the military or shattered by extended artillery use. The one thing that is familiar is the mud. It's not real bad today, but it has rained. And so there is some mud and there's, there's a, some kind of a shelter there. It was probably used for protection from artillery and mortars. You can see the remnants of it here. This is a really cool way of being able to see what things look like from this perspective at the time. There's this panoramic photo that was taken on the 9th of April, 1915, which is right before the British blew a couple of mines and retook the position. And so you can see here, uh, we're looking toward the caterpillar, which is right in through those woods right there is where the crater is where the caterpillar was and that's what it looked like then and then of course we have the rail bridge and then you can see a field grave right here that's fascinating that would have been right on the other side of the railroad you can see the german lines off in the distance you can see the british lines down here closer and then over here of course would be hill 60 Really pretty cool. Hill 60 would be right through those trees over there. From 1915 onward, mining and countermining was carried out beneath Hill 60 at a terrifying rate. The first mines were dug by the British who exploded a mine here in February 1915 and several more preceding their capture of the hill in April. There were extensive mining operations by both the British 175th Tunneling Company and the 3rd Canadian Company, but it's the Australians who are most remembered for their work here. When they arrived, the main galleries filled with explosives beneath Hill 60 and Caterpillar were already in place. It was up to the Australians to maintain those tunnels over the next seven months. They were also responsible for digging ventilation and drainage shafts and for countermining operations. 
The Germans were well aware of what was happening. And so there was a war underground. The Germans would dig shafts trying to locate the Allied mines. The Allies would dig shafts of their own and place explosives, hoping to destroy the German tunnels. Occasionally, there would be break breakthroughs, and vicious hand-to-hand -hand combat ensued deep beneath the surface. It was every bit as horrifying as we can imagine. In April of 1917, the German infantry conducted a raid into the British lines in an attempt to find the entrances to the mine galleries, but they failed to do so. On the 25th of April, 1917, a detonator exploded in the Australian underground headquarters, which killed 10 men. The official Australian history states that at Hill 60, quote, underground warfare reached a tension that was not surpassed anywhere else on the British front, end quote. It's estimated that altogether there were 30 Australian tunnelers who were killed here at Hill 60. Behind me is one of the most prominent memorials anywhere at this site, and it's to the men of the first Australian tunneling company for the incredible work and the incredible sacrifice that they experienced here, here at Hill 60. under Hill 60 and here under the Caterpillar were part of a network of 21 mines that were filled with around 1 million pounds of explosives along this part of the salient. The opening of what became known as the Battle of Messines was at that time the largest and loudest man-made explosion in history. Over a period of several minutes beginning at around 3.10 a.m. on June 7, 1917, the British simultaneously blew up 19 mines in the opening move of the Messine attack. They didn't realize it at the time, but two of the mines failed to detonate, and to this day, those mines lie beneath the surface, packed with tens of thousands of pounds of explosives. The Hill 60 mine crater uh, was 60 feet deep and 280 feet wide. The German frontline troops were overwhelmed. 10,000 of them were killed in the explosions alone. After the explosions and preceded by a creeping artillery barrage, Australian, New Zealand, and British troops advanced to find a shattered enemy. An official war historian, Charles Bean, wrote, everywhere, after firing a few scattered shots, the Germans surrendered as the troops approached. Men went along the trenches, bombing the shelters whose occupants then came out, some of them cringing like beaten animals. A Lieutenant Gerard reported that the Germans, quote, made many fruitless attempts to embrace us. I have never seen men so demoralized. When you're at Hill 60, you can't really get a sense 
of the size of the mine craters. There were, first of all, there were multiple mines that hit there. There's a lot of artillery shells that have created craters. Uh, and there's also a lot of uh, growth from trees and plants and things like that. So it's difficult to get a sense of the size and the scale of some of the bombs that were exploded there. But here at the Caterpillar, you can definitely do that because it's got one big crater from that big attack that happened during the battle for Messine Ridge. And, and so it's a great place to come and get a little more of a sense of it. And I'll be honest, I don't think it's gonna translate well onto video, it often doesn't. I've seen video of this crater before. And just like the crater at Hawthorne Ridge over at the Somme, uh, you have to see it in person to really understand just how big it is. Uh, just to understand just how devastating this would have been when it exploded under the feet of these German soldiers. So this is now standing in one of the craters for Hill 60. Hill 60 obviously is not very tall anymore. Most of it was blown to smithereens by the various explosives that were used here throughout the four years of the war. But you can at least get a little sense of the crater here. And you can see craters inside of craters, which are you know just artillery strikes that happened here. And it's just that reminder that it wasn't just one time or a few times that fighting was happening here. Everywhere you go in the Ypres salient, it's four years of conflict. It's battle on top of battle on top of battle. And it's also important to remember that anytime you stand in one of these craters like this, it's almost certain to be a war grave. There are men who were obliterated by the explosion or buried beneath the debris. Uh, who were never recovered and who lay beneath the grass here today. This bunker is one of the most fascinating parts of the battlefield here. This was originally a German shelter. It was behind the German lines. The Germans held this position for a couple of years. It was eventually taken by the Australians who converted it into the bunker that you see today. And that's what was used by the Australians. But the Great War was not the end of the fighting here. On May 27, 1940, there was fighting here during the Second World War, and there's actually damage to this bunker that was caused by the explosives used during that battle in the Second World War. Right near the tracks between Hill 60 and the Caterpillar is this memorial, which has nothing to do with the First World War, but has everything to do with the Second. These photographs in this memorial are to two French uh, resistance fighters. They were uh, near Lille 
at a train station when there was a raid by the SS and they were captured. They were on the train which was brought here toward the town of Ypres. And so uh, we really don't know for sure exactly what happened, but the likely scenario is that the train had stopped here while waiting for an additional uh, engine to come to pull it the rest of the way. And while they were stopped here, the members of the German army executed the two French resistance members, dumped their bodies off the train, and they were found here the next morning. Residents had heard the gunshots. They were found by a couple of young people here, and they were temporarily buried in town until they could be repatriated back to France. There are times in history when man's darkest experiences have produced some of his most beautiful expressions of emotion. The Great War was one of those times. On both sides, soldiers wrote diaries, letters, books, and poems that expressed what they were experiencing. Many of the greatest works produced during that time from men who before the war would never have considered themselves to be great writers. John McRae was born in Ontario, Canada, the grandson of Scottish immigrants. In medical school, he tutored the other students to help pay his own tuition. After he graduated, he served as a lieutenant in the Second Boer War in South Africa before returning to practice medicine and teach pathology at the University of Vermont in the United States. When the Great War began, McRae was appointed a major in the 1st Brigade Canadian Field Artillery. During the Second Battle of Ypres, he wrote one of the most vivid accounts of the horror of that battle that we have to this day. In a letter that he wrote home to his mother, he said, quote, For 17 days and 17 nights, none of us have had our clothes off or even our boots, except occasionally. And all that time while I was awake, gunfire and rifle fire never ceased for 60 seconds. And behind it all was the constant background of the sights of the dead, the wounded, the maimed, and a terrible anxiety lest the line should give way." End quote. McCrae worked with the wounded here at the Essex Farm Advanced Dressing Station. And as many of the men that were treated here did not survive, the Essex Farm Cemetery began receiving burials around the same time. 
April 25th, the Canadian forces here had lost 60% of their original strength of 10,000 men. The hospital and cemetery received new men every day. John McRae continued to do his best for the streams of wounded and dying men that were brought here. On May 2nd, a close friend, Lieutenant Alexis Helmer, was struck by the direct hit of an eight inch shell. There's very little left of his friend, but McRae personally performed the burial service here. And during that service, he noticed how quickly poppies seemed to sprout up around the graves of the recently buried men. The next day, Major McRae sat down and wrote his thoughts in a poem. In Flanders fields, the poppies grow between the crosses row on row that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders fields, take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands, we throw the torch, be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Witnesses to the occasion later recalled that McRae would periodically look over at his friend's grave as he wrote. When he had finished, he shared the poem with a few people, but by all accounts, he was really quite unhappy with the work. And according to those accounts, he crumbled up the paper and threw it away. One of the men present had the sense to rescue the page, and he was able to convince McRae to submit it for publication. Now, when the poem was published that December, and in many of the published works that followed, they changed the first line to say, in Flanders fields, the poppies blow rather than grow, which was what McRae originally wrote. The poem itself was instantly popular. McRae was proud of the poem's success. He hoped that it would help inspire men to do their duty, but he was also a little frustrated because it so often got published with the wrong word in the first line. Eventually, Major McRae was permanently transferred from the artillery to the medical corps, and he was stationed in Boulogne, France in June of 1915. It was there that he was promoted to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, and he was placed in charge of medicine at the number three Canadian General Hospital. He was promoted to the acting rank of Colonel on January 13th, 1918, and named consulting physician to the British armies in France. Unfortunately, Colonel McRae contracted pneumonia the same day he was promoted and later came down with cerebral meningitis. On January 28th, he died in the military hospital at Wimereau and was buried there with full military honors. As for the grave of his friend, like so many others, it was lost in the chaos of war, and it's now one of the many marked unknown here. His name was inscribed on the wall at the Menin Gate Memorial in the town. Well, I was really here at Essex Farm just to talk about John McRae and the poem, but 
There is one grave I want to highlight while we're here. It's probably the most decorated grave in the cemetery. You see all of the crosses with poppies as well as a couple of teddy bears. It's because Valentine Stredwick was just a kid. He, he really was. He was 15 years old when he was killed in January of 1916 and buried here at Essex Farm. My son will be 15 in two weeks. I, I can't even begin to imagine what his parents went through. He, he was just a kid. A lot of these were just kids. As for the poem, it gained worldwide fame. Inspired by it, American professor Moyna Michael resolved at the end of the war to begin wearing a red poppy to honor the soldiers who died. She also wrote a poem of her own called We Shall Keep the Faith. She distributed silk poppies to others and campaigned to have them adopted as an official symbol of remembrance by the American Legion. Now another woman Madame E. Gouran attended the 1920 Legion Convention and was inspired to sell poppies in her native France in order to raise money for orphans of the war. In 1921, she sent poppy sellers to London ahead of Armistice Day, and that attracted the attention of Field Marshal Douglas Haig. Haig encouraged the sale of those poppies, and the practice quickly spread throughout the British Empire. Today, over 100 years later, the poppy has become the symbol of remembrance, especially when it comes to the men of the Great War. Christmas Eve, 1914, headquarters issued a warning to the British Expeditionary Forces, quote, it is thought possible that the enemy may be contemplating an attack during Christmas or New Year. Special vigilance will be maintained during these periods, end quote. Now there had been sporadic fighting along the line on the 24th, but as night fell, in most places it grew quiet. The weather got colder, the soggy ground here began to freeze. And here in the dark, as British soldiers sat talking quietly in their trenches, just across that short, deadly space of no man's land, they heard words they didn't recognize, but a tune that was unmistakable. Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht. Alles schläft einsam wacht. Cautious heads popped up above the British trenches and then back down again. But no shots rang out. Heads popped up again to take a longer look. Some of the Brits began to join in, singing the same tune but in English. Round yon virgin mother and child. Holy infant so tender and mild. After the singing came a round of applause and happy laughter from both sides of the battlefield. 
Sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep in heavenly peace. British machine gunner Bruce Barron's father, who was later a prominent cartoonist, wrote about this incident in his memoirs. Like most of his fellow, fellow infantrymen of the 1st Battalion of the Royal Warwickshire Regiment, he was spending the holiday evening shivering in the muck, trying to keep warm. He had spent a good part of the last few months fighting against the Germans, and now, in a part of the Ypres salient called the Bois de Plugstirt, an area the British called Plug Street Wood. Barron's father was crouched in a trench that stretched just three feet deep by three feet wide. He wrote about it and he said this, quote, here I was in this horrible clay cavity, miles and miles from home, cold, wet through, and covered with mud. There didn't seem the slightest chance of leaving except in an ambulance, end quote. Barron's father wrote about the singing that began in the early evening. And then he wrote about what happened next. He said, suddenly we heard a confused shouting from the other side. We all stopped to listen. The shout came again. The voice was from an enemy soldier speaking in English with a strong German accent. He was saying, come over here, come over here. One of our British sergeants answered, you come halfway, I come halfway. Now what happened next would become a part of the lore of the Great War for all time. Enemy soldiers began to climb nervously out of their trenches and to meet in the barbed wire no man's land that separated the armies. There were handshakes, there were words of kindness, there were exchanges of gifts. The soldiers traded songs, tobacco, alcohol. They joined in a spontaneous Christmas Eve party in the cold night. Barron's father couldn't believe what he was seeing. He said, quote, here they were, the actual practical soldiers of the German army. There was not an atom of hate on either side. Just think, Oswald Tilly of the Le London Rifle Brigade wrote to his family, while you were eating turkey, I was talking and shaking hands with the very men I had been trying to kill a few hours before. It was astounding. Now there had been sporadic truces in the weeks preceding Christmas Eve, but nothing like what happened on this evening and all the next day on this part of the line. It was spontaneous, and in some cases, it lasted for a week or more. A number of the accounts of the Christmas truces from both sides involve stories of football. 
In most cases, it was just a kickabout, but in at least a few situations, they describe actual organized matches. Now, we don't know how much that really happened, but in a few cases, they even record the score. One British soldier named Ernie Williams described in an interview what he remembered about that. He said, quote, the ball appeared from somewhere. I don't know where. They made up some goals and one fellow went in goal and then it was just a general kickabout. I should think there were about a couple of a hundred taking part, end quote. Now on the German side, Lieutenant Kurt Zemschick of the 134th Saxons Infantry, who was a school teacher who spoke both English and German, also described a pickup game in his diary. That diary was discovered in an attic near Leipzig in 1999. And he said, quote, eventually the English brought a football from their trenches and pretty soon a lively game ensued. How marvelously wonderful, yet how strange it was. The English officers felt the same way about it. Thus Christmas, the celebration of love, managed to bring mortal enemies together as friends for a time." End quote. So seeing this setup here, it's, it's great for a visual, you know, seeing what the German trenches would have looked like on this side and seeing what the British trenches might have looked like on that side and with the football memorial in the center and no man's land running down between. It's a great visual, but it's important to point out this is not at all accurate as far as where the lines were. This is not where this Christmas truce happened. We are behind, well behind British lines. That's why these cemeteries, you see the two cemeteries and then there's two more back there uh, in that direction. Uh, no man's land was actually over here. And the British lines would have run probably right about where that tree is, would have been where the British uh, frontline trenches were. And then far on the other side, probably, maybe perhaps where those buildings are, is where the German lines would have been. And the account that we have from Bruce Barron's father talking about the Christmas truce, he drew a map of this whole area and exactly where things happened. And he told us in that map that his encounter with a German soldier on Christmas during the truce was over in that direction. The, the British lines went down that way, I don't know, maybe another half mile or so, and then they curved around well on the other side of the the village here and it was somewhere over in that direction is where uh, he would have had his encounter on Christmas with the Germans and so uh, if we're talking about a Christmas truce at this site we're probably talking about maybe two three hundred yards in that direction in this field in front of us. Now it wasn't all just singing, drinking, smoking and football. In many of these places there were dead from both sides who still were lying in no man's land. There are multiple reports of joint burial services held in both German and in English as they gave proper burials to men who just hours earlier had been shooting at and killing one another. In at least one place, the truce is known to have lasted through to the new year. A member of the London Regiment who served as a translator wrote about an incident that he experienced on New Year's Eve. He said that a runner came up to him and said, hey, there's a drunk German in our trenches and he won't go back to his own lines. And so the translator, uh, he wrote, so I went up and saw our platoon officer and he said, Williams, there's this chap here, he's drunk. I don't mind, it's all very well to meet him in no man's land, but he's actually in our trenches. Anyway, this chap was standing there with a couple of bottles of beer wanting us to drink the health of the new year and all the rest of it. 
He said, tell him he's got to go back. So I told him. He wouldn't take any notice. He didn't want to go back. And this officer said, well, if he stops here, he's got to be made a prisoner. Ask him if he wants to be made a prisoner. So I did. Oh, was, got nine, he said. He understood that, but he wouldn't go back. Eventually, the officer detailed another chap and me to take him back. So he was escorted to his own lines, one on each side. And this chap staggering about, singing at the top of his voice. Well, we got up to the German wire, and I thought, well, I don't think I'll go right into their trenches. They may not be as lenient as we are. Anyway, we found a gap in the wire, headed him in the right direction, and left him to it. It's fair to say the high command on both sides were not happy about these spontaneous truces. One British soldier recalled how they put a stop to it. He said, we got orders, come down the trench, get back in your trenches, every man, by word of mouth, down each trench. Everybody back in your trenches, shouting. The generals behind must have seen it and got a bit suspicious. So what they did they gave orders for a battery of guns behind us to fire and a machine gun to open out and officers to fire their revolvers at the Jerry's. Of course, that started the war again. Ooh, we were cursing them to hell, cursing the generals and that. You want to get up here in this stuff? Never mind you're giving orders in your big chateau and you're driving about in your big cars. We hated the sight of the bloody generals. Now, it's important to note that these truces, they didn't happen everywhere along the lines. There's one story told by an angry British soldier who had a, a friend he had lost just that very afternoon. And so he started shooting at the candles and the Christmas trees that the Germans were setting up above their trenches as they appeared. In many places... The war never stopped. And in future years, officers on both sides took steps to make sure that the Christmas truce of 1914 would never be repeated. But for many of the men here on the front lines of the war to end all wars, at least for one day, there was indeed peace on earth and goodwill to men.
Cazzo! My name is Jim. My name is Otto. Pleased to meet you, Otto. Freut mich. Rose, she's called. Um, it's schön. Um, it's schön. Even in the midst of a great war, armies of every nation had to deal with the problem of crime and punishment. If a soldier was judged to have committed a crime grave enough in the military service, they could face imprisonment, hard labor, even death. For a death sentence to be approved, it had to be confirmed by the commander in chief of the theater. Over the course of the war, over 3,000 British, Dominion, or colonial soldiers were sentenced to death, but most of those sentences were then reduced to imprisonment, field punishment, or suspended. In the end, 346 soldiers were executed by firing squad. Of those, the vast majority were in France and Belgium on the Western Front. 291 were British, 25 Canadian, five from New Zealand, and four from the British West Indian Regiment. The remaining 21 were made up of assorted soldiers and civilians who operated under military law, such as Chinese Labor Corps individuals. Australian soldiers were subject to the death penalty, but the Australian government had transferred the power to confirm the death sentence to the Governor General of Australia, Sir Ronald Munro Ferguson, who always reduced death sentences for Australian soldiers to imprisonment. Figures regarding the crimes for which soldiers were executed can be difficult to decipher. But the vast majority of executions which took place here on the Western Front were for desertion. Once the sentence was confirmed by the commanding general, it was carried out soon after. The men were taken to a suitable location as near to their place of confinement as possible. The procedures for military executions for the British Army called for a squad of 12 men, though it was sometimes less, armed with rifles, commanded by a lieutenant. Steps were taken to avoid any undue strain on the enlisted men who made up the firing squad. So when the squad had arrived at the place of execution, their unloaded weapons were laid on the ground and the men were led away out of sight. The officer would then load 10 of the rifles with live rounds and two with blanks. This allowed, at least in theory, each man in the squad 
the opportunity to believe that they had fired the blank round and therefore had not actually killed their fellow soldier. Now, how much this really made a difference is hard to determine as it was quite likely the men could tell the difference between a live round and a blank one when the rifle was fired. In most cases, after the volley had been fired, the sergeant in the squad would then pull out his pistol and put a bullet in the head of the condemned man. It was brutal and it was efficient. The men here in the area of the Ypres salient who were arrested for desertion were often taken to these prison cells here in Poppering. There are two of them that you can see to this day while they awaited their trial. When they were put on trial, it was in this building upstairs here in the town hall. If they were found guilty and if they were sentenced to death and that death sentence was confirmed by the commander in chief, they were taken from this cell out into the courtyard where they were executed. It's an eerie thing. There's nobody here. There's just a door that you open and walk in on your own. There's nobody here like showing you around or keeping an eye on things. It's just here. We're gonna look around at some of the things that they actually wrote on the walls in here. So we're now here in the courtyard, right next to the death cells, which were in, in this building right here. That's the cell right there, you can see it. Uh, and they have the post here, but I'm told by people who know these things that this is not the actual location where they were executed. They would have been executed out 
in the courtyard on the other side of this building. But we are very close to the spot where those executions took place. The men who were executed by the British during the war are buried in military cemeteries scattered all over Europe. But the largest collection of executed men in one place by far is here in Poppering. The Poppering New Military Cemetery was established in June of 1915. Prior to that, British and Commonwealth soldiers were buried in what is called the Old Military Cemetery here. This cemetery contains 677 Commonwealth burials of the First World War, as well as 271 French war graves on the other side. Now, walking among the graves, it's impossible to tell the difference between men who were killed by enemy fire, men who died of a disease or accident, and the men who were executed by their own army. 17 of those who were executed in Poppering in 1916 and 1917 are buried here. So here in row F, we have a very unique concentration of the executed men who were shot at dawn over the span of a couple of weeks. We have Stedman here, who was executed on the 5th of September. Sergeant Wall was executed the next day on the 6th of September. Everill, Private Everill was executed on the 14th of September. And then just a young teenager, Morris, private from the British West Indies Regiment, was executed on the 20th of September. And I thought this was interesting. Somebody left a note here that says, War is hell. He simply did what many would do. Rest in peace. Herbert Morris was 16 years old when he enlisted in Jamaica in December of 1916. He arrived in France in April 1917 as part of the 6th Battalion British West Indies Regiment. On August the 20th, he went missing from a work party here in the Ypres Salient. He turned up the next day at a rest camp in Boulogne without his rifle, equipment, or a leave pass, so he was arrested. At his trial on the 7th of September, Morris, who was unrepresented by any defense, made an unsworn statement uh, where he stated that he could not stand the sound of the guns and that the doctor that he had seen on the 19th of August gave him no satisfaction. Despite this defense, no medical examination was ordered, nor was a doctor called in to testify. Two of his officers gave evidence that Morris had never given any trouble and had worked willingly, but it further appeared that Morris had gone missing at least once before back in July and was given two weeks of field punishment for that offense before being sent back to the line. He was convicted of desertion and executed on the 20th of September 1917. He was just 17 years old.
Eric Poole was born in Canada in 1885, but his family moved to England at some point before the war. In October 1914, he volunteered for the artillery. Eventually, he was given a commission in the infantry, and he came to the Western Front with the 11th Battalion, West Yorkshire Regiment. In the first week of July of 1916, while fighting at the Somme, he was nearly buried alive by the close impact of an artillery shell. And while he survived that impact, he came away with a severe case of what was then known as shell shock. He was medically evacuated from the line, but at the end of August, he was returned to the front in command of a platoon in C Company. On the 5th of October, he went AWOL as the battalion moved back to the front line trenches. Two days later, he was arrested and put on trial for desertion in the face of the enemy. His court-martial began in late November with six witnesses called to testify. One of them was a doctor who testified that Poole was in a psychological condition that had rendered him unfit to be placed in charge of a command at the time of his actions. He clearly had post-traumatic stress. It was shown that Poole was confused at the time he went AWOL and didn't seem to understand the seriousness of his actions. Even the officers in charge of the court-martial acknowledged that he appeared to have been suffering from a nervous collapse at the time of the offense. Now, despite that testimony, Poole was found guilty of desertion and sentenced to be shot. On December 3rd, a few days before his execution was set to take place, he was examined by an army medical board, but the board concluded that he was, quote, of sound mind and capable of appreciating the nature of his actions, end quote. Poole's brigade, division, and corps commanders all recommended that his sentence be commuted. But Commander-in-Chief of the BEF, General Sir Douglas Haig, confirmed the verdict and sentence, and he noted in his diary that it was, quote, highly important that all ranks should realize that the law is the same for an officer as a private, end quote. On December 10th, Eric Poole became the first commissioned British officer to be shot at dawn during the Great War. Not all executed soldiers appear to have been suffering from shell shock. George Everill of the 1st Battalion North Staffordshire Regiment is one of those men. On separate occasions over a period of 18 months, he was convicted of using insubordinate language, of willful defiance, absence, and using threatening language. Following his punishment for the last offense, he was again convicted of willful defiance for which he was serving field punishment when he was warned to be ready to move up for active operations. When his unit was mustered later in the day, he disappeared, leaving his rifle and equipment behind. He was found and arrested the next day. At his court-martial, he chose not to question even a single witness and made no statement in his own defense. He was shot at dawn on September 14, 1917.
Private Albert Troughton had fought bravely in his last action with the 1st Battalion Royal Welsh Fusiliers. But after he was notified of his brother's death, he wandered off for three hours and was arrested. He was tried for desertion and sentenced to be shot. On April 21st, 1915, he wrote a letter to his family that was smuggled out of his jail cell. Dear mother and father, sisters and brothers, just a few lines to let you know I am in the best of health and hope you are, mother. I'm sorry to have to tell you that I am to be shot tomorrow at 7 o'clock in the morning, the 22nd of April. I hope you will take it in good part and not upset yourself. I shall die like a soldier. So goodbye, mother, father, sisters, and brothers, if any left. Remember me to Mr. Kendall and them who knew me. Mother, I'm very sorry nothing happened to me at Ypres. I should not have went away, and then I might have stood a good chance of being still alive. But I think that they are paying the debt at the full rate. I thought the most they would give me would be about 10 years. It is worse than waiting to be hung. I hope you got my letters which I sent you while waiting for my court-martial. It seems that something told me I would be shot, so I think the time has come for me to die. I am only a common soldier, and all civilians should know that I have fought for my country in hail, sleet, and snow. To the trenches we have to go. All my comrades have been slaughtered, which I think everyone should know. When our regiment was captured, the colonel loudly strained, everyone for himself. But on and on I fought and got clear of the German trenches. This is the punishment I get for getting clear of the Germans. I have written my last letter to you all at home. So mother, don't be angry with me because I have gone to rest. And pray for me and I will pray for you. Remember me to Mr. Newbold and tell him about it. I've been silly to go away, but if you knew how worried I was and almost off my head, think how we had been slaughtered at the beginning of the war. You think they would have a bit of pity for those who are living for their country. Goodbye to all at home. Goodbye, goodbye, from your son, Albert. There are 23,000 separate burial sites for the nearly 1.7 million British and Commonwealth soldiers buried around the world. The largest of these anywhere in the world is Tynecott Cemetery here on the Passchendaele battlefield. That name, Tynecott, is said to have come from the Northumberland Fusiliers, who noticed a resemblance between the German concrete pillboxes here and the typical Tyneside workers' cottages, Tyne Cots. This area contained several German bunkers, which were captured by the 3rd Australian Division during the battle for Passchendaele. One of those bunkers was unusually large, and it was used as an advanced dressing station after its capture. From October the 6th of 1917 until the end of March 1918, over 300 burials were made on either side of the bunker by the 50th and 33rd Divisions and by a few Canadian units. The cemetery and the surrounding area fell back into German hands in 
between April and September of 1918 before it was finally recaptured by the Belgian army. There are now nearly 12,000 Commonwealth servicemen from the First World War buried or commemorated in Tynecott Cemetery. Over 8,000 of those burials remain unidentified. But there are also special memorials to more than 80 casualties who are believed to be among those. Other special memorials commemorate 20 casualties whose graves were destroyed by shell fire. And there are also four German burials in this cemetery, three of them unknown. Christopher Hartley, age 31. As you walk up to the Tynecott Cemetery, you hear the names being read. The names and the ages of the men who fell here. It's quite something, and it's really kind of the first thing you notice before you even arrive at the visitor center. G.S. Waterman, age unknown. Lewis Fleming Jenkin, age 22. Reginald Ryman, age 20. So as I often do with my visits to these cemeteries on these battlefields, I want to take the time to share some stories here. Specifically, we are going to be sharing the stories of six recipients of the Victoria Cross who are either buried here in a known grave or who are commemorated on the tablets for the missing. I've also brought along photos of some of the soldiers who are buried here and flags that I want to place uh, just as a special way to honor them today. Behind me and going all the way around this part of the cemetery uh, is a memorial wall to the nearly 35,000 British and Anzac soldiers whose bodies were never identified, who were killed in action uh, or declared missing after August of 1917. When you add those to the names of the missing on the Menin Gate Memorial, you're up to around 90,000 British and Commonwealth soldiers whose bodies were never properly identified, who either lie in an unknown grave in one of these cemeteries or were never found and are still out on the battlefield somewhere. Ernest Seaman originally served as a baker in the British Army Service Corps before being allowed to join the front lines with the 2nd Battalion Royal Inniskillen Fusiliers near the end of the war. His Victoria Cross citation reads, quote, On 29 September 1918, at Terhand, Belgium, when the right flank of his company was held up by machine guns by the enemy, Lance Corporal Seaman went forward under heavy fire with his Lewis gun and engaged the position single-handed, capturing two machine guns and 12 prisoners and killing one officer and two men. Later on in the day, he again rushed another machine gun post, capturing the gun under very heavy fire. He was killed immediately afterwards, but it was due to his gallant conduct that his company 
was able to push forward to its objective. His body was never identified, and so he's remembered today on this tablet of the missing. Philip Eric Bent was a Lieutenant Colonel in the 9th Battalion, Leicestershire Regiment. He was born in Nova Scotia, Canada, and he served as the 26-year-old Lieutenant Colonel of the 9th Battalion. During actions on the 1st of October, 1917, east of Polygon Wood, Lieutenant Colonel Bent was in command of a part of the 9th Battalion on his right. When they were forced back due to the intensity of German artillery fire, he personally collected a platoon that was in reserve at the time and led them forward in a counterattack. After issuing orders to the other officers to support a defense of the rest of the line, he was killed while leading that charge, which resulted in securing a portion of the line which was essential for subsequent operations for his most conspicuous bravery. He was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross on January 11th, 1918. Like so many here, his body was never identified. And so he's on the tablet behind me in honor of all of the men who are forever unidentified from the Leicestershire Regiment. William Clamp was born in Motherwell, Scotland, and he served as a corporal in the 6th Battalion Yorkshire Regiment of the British Army. In actions at Polkapel on October 9th, 1917, Corporal Clamp rushed a German machine gun and captured 20 prisoners. He brought them back to the rear and then returned again to the front. He continued forward, leading others to another enemy position when he was killed by a sniper. For gallantry in face of the enemy, he was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross, which was presented to his parents by His Majesty King George V at Buckingham Palace on March 2nd, 1918. Sergeant Lewis McGee was born in Ross in Tasmania, and he was a member of the 40th Battalion of the Australian Imperial Forces. On October 12, 1917, his company was stopped by machine gun fire from a concrete pillbox. On his own, he single-handedly rushed the position armed only with a revolver, shot several of the crew, and captured the rest. He then reorganized the remnants of his platoon and enabled the advance to proceed on to success. He was killed in action later on in the fight. And for his bravery, he was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross in November of 1917. Now you notice that unlike the other sections of the cemetery, uh, these graves are not neatly spaced in a row. They're often bunched together. There are several names on some of these markers. This one here says eight unknown soldiers of the Great War, plus four Australian soldiers. And what that tells us is that this is the original section of this cemetery. These are the initial graves who were placed here uh, when this bunker, which is under this marker here, was being used as a uh, forward hospital, basically a, a dressing station, a place to uh, stabilize men as best you could before you got them uh, back to a better aid station. And then the other graves were eventually brought here from other places. Yeah, here it says this was the Tynecott blockhouse captured by the 3rd Australian Division, 4th October 1917. That was on the final push to Passchendaele. You know, walking through this cemetery is just uh, such a great reminder of the international makeup of these British and Commonwealth forces. We often just lump them all in as the British or the British Empire. 
but I just walked down a single row of graves here at Tynecott and I saw South Africa and Canada and Australia and New Zealand and Ireland and then all manner of uh, different counties in England, but then also Scotland. Uh, just, and of course there were Indian troops that fought here as well. And there were uh, troops from various nations in Africa fighting particularly with the French. Uh, it really, truly was a world war here on the Ypres salient. And here we have the only named German soldier in this cemetery killed on 4th October 1917, plus an unknown burial as well. And then there are others. So right here we see one of the examples of one of the German concrete emplacements that are still in existence here at the Tynecott uh, Cemetery site. And they're built pretty darn solid. I mean, they've got some damage, but these are a hundred years old. And I mean, they are solid inside of there. It's really quite impressive that even with all of the action that happened here, these things are as intact as they are. This is one grave in particular that I was looking for in here. Uh, and it's because of one of the cool things about uh, British and Commonwealth war graves is that the families get to choose uh, what they want to have written on the bottom. Uh, they also have these personalized um, icons on each one of them that uh, either there's a cross or they also almost always have their regimental crest on there but this particular one this is second lieutenant arthur conway young of the royal irish fusiliers and he was born in japan uh, but he was a british soldier and his family chose to have written on his grave sacrificed to the fallacy that war can end war powerful stuff james peter robertson was born in nova scotia and he served as a private in the 27th Battalion of the Manitoba Regiment of the Canadian Infantry. On the 6th of November, 1917, during the assault on Passchendaele, Private Robertson's platoon was held up by uncut wire and an enemy machine gun, which was causing severe casualties. On his own, he rushed the machine gun and after a desperate struggle with the crew, he killed four and then turned the gun on the remainder who were running toward their own lines. He inflicted more casualties among the enemy, and then he led his platoon to the final objective while carrying the captured machine gun. Once at the objective, he once again got the machine gun into action, firing on the retreating enemy and suppressing the fire of enemy snipers. Later on during the battle, when two of his comrades were badly wounded in front of his trench. Robertson went out and carried one of them to safety under severe fire. He was killed just as he returned with the second man. For his most conspicuous bravery, he was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross on January 11th, 1918.
medieval times, the original narrow gateway on the eastern wall of the Ypres fortifications was called the Hangover Port, port being the Dutch word for gate. During the 17th and 18th centuries, while under the occupation of the Habsburgs and the French, the city was increasingly fortified. You can see remnants of that all over the city today. But by the outbreak of the First World War in August of 1914, the eastern exit simply cut through the remains of the ramparts and crossed a moat. The gateway was by this time known as the Menin Port or the Menin Gate in English because the road leading through the gateway led to the small town of Menin. This site was chosen to be a memorial as it was the closest gate of the town to the fighting. And so it was assumed that Allied troops would have marched past it on their way to fight. But in reality, most of the troops passed out of the other gates of Ypres because the Menin Gate was too dangerous because it was too close to the fighting. And there was constant fear of artillery fire here. The memorial itself contains the names on stone panels of over 54,000 British and Commonwealth soldiers who died in the salient, but whose bodies have either never been identified or never found at all. But on completion of the memorial, it was discovered to be far too small to contain all the names as it was originally planned. And so a cutoff point had to be chosen. The latest date for which men are listed here after being killed is August 15, 1917. And so the 35,000 missing from August 16, 1917 to the end of the war were instead inscribed on the Tynecott Memorial to the missing. It's important as well to point out that this memorial does not list the names of the missing for New Zealand or Newfoundland soldiers who are instead honored on separate memorials. I've stayed surprisingly unemotional so far in my week here in Ypres. This is day four for me here. But there's something about this memorial that really gets to me. You hear the number 55,000 and you know these numbers they just become numbers when you're talking about the Great War because it's just so many. There's just so, so many. I mean, something like 17 million people died because of that war. But then you come here and you start walking around and you see these names and they just go on and on and on. You come around a corner and then you see a couple thousand more names and you realize that every single one of these small inscriptions represents a life that ended way too soon. It represents, in many cases, a mother, a wife, children. And there are thousands of them. And these aren't even all of the names just of the missing from Ypres. These are a little more than half of them. These are a little more than half of just the missing who were never identified of one army in one small part of one front of this war. This is just Ypres. 
This doesn't count the men whose graves are known, and those are, are tens of thousands more. And it's just the British. Then you have the French and the Belgians and the Germans. And then you go to other places and you have Italians and Ottomans and you have Americans and you have Austro-Hungarians and Bulgarians and Romanians. It's something to really ponder, just looking at all these names and just realizing what an absolute horrifying waste this war was. When this memorial was dedicated in 1927, Field Marshal Lord Plummer gave a speech. And one of the things at the end he said was, now it can be said of these men, he is not missing, he is here. Can only imagine the pain would have been bad enough for a family to have lost someone in the war but then to not know where they are, to not have a grave to visit. It's one of the reasons why they have the unknown warrior at Westminster Abbey, because he represents all of these names. One of these names on this memorial here could be the man who's buried at Westminster Abbey among kings. It's a right place for him to be. The inscription that you see here where it says, uh, here are recorded names of officers and men who fell in the Ypres salient, but to whom the fortune of war denied the known and honored burial given to their comrades in death. That was written by Rudyard Kipling, the famous British author. The highest ranking officer to have his name inscribed here at the Menin Gate is Brigadier General Charles Fitzclarence, who is a recipient of the Victoria Cross for his actions during the Boer War. But here at Ypres, he was leading the 1st Guards Brigade as they were being overwhelmed by just massive numbers of German soldiers during the First Battle of Ypres. And he was killed and his body was lost. But something else kind of interesting about Fitzclarence, the reason he has that name, Fitzclarence, which is a name often that was given to the illegitimate children of royalty. Well, that's the case here. Uh, his grandfather was an illegitimate son of who, the man at the time who was the Duke of Clarence, but who later became King William IV. And so Charles Fitzclarence was a great grandson of King William IV, making him a cousin to King George V at the time of his death. The lions that you see behind me that are a part of the Menin Gate are not uh, very old actually, they're only about four years old. 
They were placed here in 2018, but uh, the originals that were here uh, were battle damaged and were donated to the nation of Australia by the city of Ypres in 1936 as a way of saying thank you for the nearly 13,000 Australian soldiers who died defending Belgium during the Great War. They were restored by the Australian government and I think around 10 or 11 years ago were placed on display at the Australian War Memorial in Canberra, the capital city. Following the opening of the memorial in 1927, the citizens of Ypres wanted to express their gratitude toward those who had given their lives for Belgium's freedom. And so every evening at 8 p.m., buglers from the Last Post Association close the road which passes under the memorial and sound the last post. Except for the time during the occupation by Germans in World War II when the daily ceremony was conducted at Brookwood Military Cemetery in Surrey in England. This ceremony has been carried out uninterrupted every single night since July 2nd, 1928. On the very evening that Polish forces liberated Ypres in the Second World War on September 6th, 1944, the ceremony returned despite the fact that heavy fighting was still taking place in other parts of the town. I've had the opportunity to witness it a couple of times this week, and I have to say it is a very moving experience, and I want to invite you to watch the ceremony that I saw my first night here. They should grow not old, as those that are left grow old. 
Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. The first battle of Ypres produced one of the most enduring German legends of the war. Like most legends, there's some truth and some probably fabricated. In an effort to drive the Allies from Ypres and capture the channel ports in the fall of 1914, the German army hastily sent tens of thousands of fresh, poorly trained recruits to form what became known as the Fourth Army under Crown Prince Albrecht of Württemberg. The story goes that these young student soldiers marched singing to their deaths by the tens of thousands. Even Adolf Hitler wrote about it in Mein Kampf. He was here during the first battle of Ypres and in his account he wrote this, quote, with feverish eyes, each one of us was drawn forward faster and faster over turnip fields and hedges, till suddenly the fight began, the fight of man against man. But from the distance, the sound of a song met our ears, coming nearer and nearer, passing from company to company. And then, while death busily plunged his hand into our rows, the song reached also us, and now we passed it on. In November of 1914, German newspapers shared accounts of this same army of students. One reported it this way, quote, West of Langemark, 
youthful regiments stormed the first lines of the enemy trenches and took them. They took approximately 2,000 prisoners, French regulars all, end quote. The story went on to describe how the student volunteers advanced silently through fog. There was no preliminary artillery barrage that might tip off the enemy. The volunteers are discovered anyway, and fire from a source they cannot see chops down their closely packed rows arm in arm. They lie in the open, unable to advance or retreat. The news account writes, quote, in this hour, they have become men, end quote. Then the miracle happens. A voice rises in song. Then another and another takes up the holy words. The young soldiers rise up as one and storm forward. They sing as they run. Some are helmetless, their heads wrapped in bloody bandages. With their burning eyes, they are like an unreal figure from an old saga. In some versions of the story, the volunteers sweep over the enemy trenches. In others, the song dies as they die. And silent gray heaps litter the damp fields in front of Langemark. The German public began to refer to this incident by a name that was used in the Bible, the Massacre of the Innocents. Innocent child soldiers slaughtered as they charged bravely into the finest soldiers in the British Army. The truth is a little less compelling. There were certainly thousands of poorly trained student soldiers who fell in the First Battle of Ypres and they were fighting against the best of the best of the British Army. But they didn't die all at once in one grand charge by a single force on a single battlefield. And those student soldiers made up perhaps 15 to 20 percent of the total number of men who fell here. And yes, even some of the British tell stories of some of these young men singing as they marched into battle. But the singing was actually quite an, a common phenomenon on battlefields of the Western Front. In addition to helping with morale, it also helped to provide unit cohesion in the chaos and confusion of a battlefield. Now those student soldiers who were killed in 1914 are buried here in the Langemark German Cemetery. The cemetery here at Langemark is one of 13 German cemeteries in Belgium from the two world wars. In different sections lie the remains of over 44,000 German soldiers of the first world war. Nearly 25,000 of them lie in the comrades grave, the mass grave of unknowns in the center of the cemetery. Among those probably buried there are two of Germany's leading flying aces Knights of the Air from the war. In another large section are buried men under grave markers with inscriptions. And then there's a third section of the cemetery dedicated to those student soldiers who were killed in the fall of 1914. So one of the things that just is so striking about coming to this cemetery is seeing the mass grave. And I'm going to come to the end of it here, right in the corner, because I want you to see all the bigger it is. That's it. Just to the end of where the walls are that show the lists of the missing, this is the mass grave. But in this small section of the cemetery that I could walk from one end of to the other in less than 10 seconds, lie 25,000 German soldiers. 25,000 in just this small area. I mean, the names, 
on the walls just go on and on and on. With 48 aerial victories, Van der Foss was fourth among all German aces in World War I. In my opinion, he may have been their best pilot. He was a close friend of Manfred von Richthofen, with whom he would go hunting at the Voss family lodge when they were on leave. When the war broke out in 1914, much like Richthofen, he was initially in the cavalry. But in 1915, he transferred to the Flying Forces where he trained as a pilot and was then selected to be an instructor. By April of 1916, he had achieved his 24th aerial victory in just under five months, and he was awarded the Port Le Merite by Kaiser Wilhelm II. In May of 1917, he transferred to Jagdstaffel V and achieved his 34th victory. He was then given command of his own squadron. He was best known for flying the Fokker DR-1 triplane, and it was in that plane that he achieved his final victories, 22 coming in the last three weeks of his life. He was killed in a solo dogfight with eight RAF aces over Belgium, where he disabled or damaged seven of the eight planes before being brought down. His body was buried in a shell hole near where he was found, but the location was later lost. And so his memorial here is a cenotaph. He is believed to be buried in the mass grave behind me. But it's also possible his body is still out there on the battlefield. Foss is not the only German ace buried in this mass grave. Erwin Bohm flew under the command of the great Oswald Bolke. On October 28, 1916, Erwin and Oswald were involved in a dogfight with British planes. The wheels of Erwin's plane briefly touched the top wing of Oswald's plane, but that caused enough damage to the fabric of his plane to send Oswald to his death. Erwin was distraught at having caused accidentally the death of not only his co commander and friend, but the man considered to be the father of German combat aviation. Bohm reportedly had to be talked out of suicide by his friend, uh, Manfred von Richthofen. He did continue to fly and he was ultimately credited with 24 aerial victories. He was awarded the Pour Le Merite on November 24, 1917, but he died before receiving it. He was killed in an aerial fight with British lieutenants John Pattern and Philip Leister on November 29, 1917, one month to the day after proposing marriage to Anna Marie Bruning. The statue behind me shows four bronze figures at the head of the mass grave. It was created by Munich sculptor Professor Emil Krieger. He was inspired by a photograph of soldiers from the 238th Reserve Infantry Regiment that was taken in 1918 of soldiers mourning at the grave of a fallen comrade. Well, that photograph was reproduced in German press and it became quite popular in 1918. Unfortunately, one of the soldiers in that photo was killed just two days after it was taken. The statue itself was originally located near the entrance building of the cemetery, but in later redevelopment of the cemetery, it was moved here to its current location on the western end. So in addition to the 
tens of thousands of Germans who are buried here. It's believed that there are at least two British soldiers buried here as well. And their names are right here on the end of one of the tablets for the missing. It's Private uh, A. Carroll uh, of the Loyal North Lancaster Regiment uh, who uh, died on the 4th of November in 1918 and Private L.H. Lockley of the Seaforth Highlanders who died a few days earlier on the 30th of October. They're probably in this mass grave. The Ypres salient by 1917 was already hell on earth. Three years of trench warfare have devastated the surrounding countryside. Whole villages in no man's land have simply ceased to exist. The Germans continue to hold the high ground surrounding the British positions in the salient with clear views for their artillery observers. Most of this land is reclaimed marshland that lies just below sea level and it was only habitable because of a network of drainage ditches. Well, three years of war have now destroyed that system, and the whole salient is a swamp. The soil isn't conducive to the trenches built elsewhere along the front, and so the Germans have dotted the landscape with strong points, reinforced cement pillboxes. The Allies were not in a good place by the summer of 1917. The French were wavering after mutinies, and the Russians were dealing with revolutions at home. It was up to British Commander Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig to take the pressure off both. After a stunning victory at Messines Ridge on the southern end of the salient, Haig thought it was possible to push the Germans off Passchendaele Ridge to the northeast as well. The preliminary British bombardment in what became the Third Battle of Ypres began on July 16th. 3,000 heavy guns rained shells along the entire German line surrounding the salient. The bombardment lasted for two weeks. The advance began on July 31st. It was brutal from the beginning. Men's boots got stuck in the dirt as they struggled over the soft, cratered ground. It was slow and it was exhausting. Many of the men were carrying up to 80 pounds of equipment. Despite all of this, the initial attack did see some success. The men cleared trenches and dugouts and captured a number of German prisoners. British command judged 
from the first reports that a breakthrough might be imminent and that the capture of Passchendaele Ridge itself might be possible. The problem was that all they'd really done so far was to take a few forward positions and machine gun outposts. The Germans had abandoned the traditional system of trench lines and it instead focused on a defense in depth system that went on for miles. So as the British soldiers pushed forward, they suddenly found themselves under well-directed fire from camouflaged strong points, hidden pillboxes, and snipers. They had, in fact, by taking the frontline trenches, just entered the real kill zone. The first waves were mowed down or soon found themselves isolated from the rest of their units. Then, as the days went on, it began to rain. The steady downpour soaked the entire salient. Every man and gun was soon drenched, and that softened ground now turned into an ugly quagmire of mud and clay. On the battlefield, all sense of direction was lost. The terrain had changed so much that old maps and even the more recent ones were completely useless. Corporal Joseph Pincombe of the Queen's Westminster Rifles described what he experienced. He said, quote, it was an extraordinary panorama, half frightening, half exciting. Everywhere, as far as you could see, there were spurts of earth from shells bursting and bursts of shrapnel and high explosives and men looking like ants in the distance. You couldn't speak. The gunfire was so terrific, but you don't really hear the explosions individually. You just see them going off like geysers shooting up in the air. As far as you could see in front of you and to either side, there was nothing but mud, mud, mud for miles and just a few stumps of trees here and there and all hell let loose all around you. The stretcher bearers had it especially hard. Each step they took was exhausting. It took four to six men to carry one stretcher, and even small distances would take hours. At night, the time when most wounded men would normally have been evacuated, the task was simply impossible. The risk was just too high of getting lost or getting stuck in the mud. Many of the wounded died waiting for someone to come. And the Germans shared in their misery. And it was reported that there was an unspoken rule on both sides not to fire on stretcher parties. Lieutenant James Annan of the Royal Scots described it this way. He said, quote, Then there was a lull in the shelling. And through the machine gun slit on the back wall of the pillbox, we heard this terrible kind of gurgling noise. It was the wounded lying there sinking, and this liquid mud burying them alive, running over their faces into their mouth and nose. We had to keep heaving the duck boards up and trying to put some other stuff underneath just so that the fellows wouldn't sink so much. We couldn't understand why in the name of God anyone ordered an attack like that over terrain like that. It was impossible. The men had to leave the safety of their trenches as the water rose above their waists in many places. Artillery sank deeper into the mud with every shell fired. Engineers tried to bridge flooded shell holes with pontoons and wooden walkways known as duck boards. There was a constant fear of falling off and drowning in the mud, which operated much like quicksand. Quicksand. 
Many soldiers suffered the horrible death of sinking into the mud, his friends unable to pull him out. Tens of thousands of men were never recovered from the battlefield. Now a private in the Royal Fusiliers remembered it this way. He said, quote, in a way it was worse when the mud didn't suck you down. When it yielded under your feet, you knew that it was a body that you were treading on. It was terrifying. You'd tread on the stomach perhaps and it would grunt out all the air of its body. It made your hair stand on end. The smell could make you vomit. And you could always tell whether it was a dead Jerry or a dead Tommy. The Germans smelt different in death. There are a number of stories to be told about the Battle of Passchendaele, and we'll be visiting those in the future. But for now, I want to take a look at where the battle finally came to an end. The final push that resulted in the capture of Passchendaele Ridge was made over a two-week period in late October and early November 1917 by a force made up of Canadian, British, Australian, French, and Belgian divisions. By October 30th, the Canadian Corps had relieved the exhausted 2nd Anzac Corps and prepared for an assault on a position here at Passchendaele Ridge known as Crest Farm. The assault was successful and the Canadians eventually drove into the village of Passchendaele itself. Now fighting would continue until November 10th when the Third Battle of Ypres finally came to an end. Today, the Passchendaele Canadian Memorial marks the site here at Crest Farm where the men of the Canadian Corps who were commanded by Lieutenant General Sir Arthur Curry finally took possession of the high ground that had been held by the Germans since 1914. Now before the final assault, General Curry had predicted it would cost the four Canadian divisions involved in the fight around 16,000 casualties. In the end, the total was 15,654, including 4,000 dead. Nine Canadian soldiers received the Victoria Cross for their actions here in the last weeks of the battle. The last of those was given to Private James Peter Robertson of the 27th Battalion, Canadian Expeditionary Force. So just to kind of orient ourselves a little bit from here at Crest Farm, down there in the valley, there's this kind of waterway that runs through kind of a natural divide that was all flooded during the time of the Battle of Passchendaele. 
And so where I'm standing would have been where the second Canadian division was. And on the other side of that divide would have been the first Canadian division. They would have been attacking over to the left as we're looking at Passchendaele over to the left, while the second division would have been here at Crest Farm, making the final push from Crest Farm up to Passchendaele itself. And then they would have consolidated their position here around the end of October, and then another week to 10 days to push up the hill, take the village of Passchendaele itself, and then push a little beyond, which was their final objective, which they finally reached around November 10th. So this is a fantastic map that gives us a sense of where we are in the midst of all of this. We are right here at Crest Farm and there's the village of Passchendaele. So this is that direction there. I wish they had put this map and kind of oriented it better. But um, so we're seeing here that this is where the 27th Battalion attacked on the final push for Passchendaele uh, between the 30th of October and the 8th of November. And the fields behind me that I was showing a little bit earlier are the lines over which the 12th Canadian Infantry Brigade would have been attacking. And then to their left, uh, part of the 1st Canadian Division, you can see the units there that were attacking up and around. Uh, but it was the 27th Battalion and the 72nd Battalion that were actually the ones who took Passchendaele itself. Just to put the final push on Passchendaele in perspective, from where I'm standing at the Crest Farm to the church behind me, it's less than half a mile away. It took 10 days for the Canadian soldiers to make the 700 meters between here and there. Quite overwhelming when you think about it. Standing six foot three inches tall, Robertson, known as Singing Pete, was popular and a highly regarded soldier who had refused all offers of promotion. A man noted for his willingness to take risks. On the 6th of November, 1917, he was a part of the 27th Battalion advancing toward Passchendaele from here at Crest Farm down toward the church. They followed a creeping barrage as they advanced, but the nearer they came to the village, the fiercer the opposition grew. One machine gun was proving difficult to overcome, blocking the way into the main street, and it was heavily defended. Three times the platoon had charged, only to be driven back when Robertson decided to do something. While his comrades were firing their Lewis guns and rifles at the machine gun post, Robertson leapt up and sprinted alone across the line of fire, dashing around the flank. He hurtled the barbed wire fence and set about the gun team with his bayonet. Within seconds, four men were dead and the remainder fled. And as they did, Robertson turned their own machine gun on them. This allowed the Canadians to advance through the village with Peter Robertson at the front of the advance, setting up his captured weapon and using it on repeated occasions with great effect on the Germans. It took about 30 minutes for them to clear Passchendaele and an hour later, the eastern crest of the ridge beyond the village. The rest of the day was spent consolidating their position, but there were some minor firefights that continued throughout the day. Now, when Robertson saw in one of these later firefights that two snipers from his battalion were lying wounded ahead of their own lines. He went out to bring them in. He rescued the first one, but the enemy were beginning to close in, making it more dangerous to go back for the second. But he ignored those risks and went back out again. 
Captain Theodore Rob Roberts wrote about what happened next. He said, quote, he fell before reaching the second man. He was probably hit, but he picked himself up and continued on his way and secured his second comrade. Slipping on the sticky mud, nearly exhausted, he stuck to his man and had put him down close to our line when an unlucky shell exploded nearby, killing him instantly, end quote. Private Robertson is buried today in the Tynecott Cemetery. I visited his grave in my video about Tynecott. He was one of the last of over half a million men who fell here on the fields of Passchendaele.